mm. that. Mm. And a big move yesterday made by the Mariners, Jerry DePoto, joining us right now to discuss. Jerry, we haven't spoken to you in forever. How are you? Good morning. Good morning, guys. How's your uh, How's your winter been? Busy. Yeah. <laughs> kind of kind of busy we, we've not had a coaching change in like 14 years so that is just uh that's new on the other side of the street and then it feels like jerry it's been a much more active off season for you guys certainly than maybe a few of the uh, off seasons prior yeah, we're always busy you know just trying to find ways to get better one step at a time and this uh this off season has probably been a little bit more of a winding path than than most before it but you know, I, I, we wake up and I like where we sit as we head towards spring training. How uh, how did this Polanco deal come to be? Uh, it came to be, I would say, through sheer will on the part of Justin Hollander. <laughs> it was, uh, you know, this has been a long time in the making. We have had conversations with the twins about Jorge Polanco dating back to 2021. And, you know, we were finally able to get it across the, the line and, you know, a ton of credit to Justin for hanging in and constantly working the phone and having more conversations about how this could possibly come together than than is reasonable in any trade discussion. And, you know, in this particular case, it's a it's a player we just feel fits perfectly in what we're trying to do. What does that look like when you say just sheer force of will on Justin's part? When how many phone calls is hello, that? What, what, hello, who's there? Uh, yeah. Hollander on line one. I hello, mean, like, what hello, is, uh, what who's there? They, Hollander on line two. What do those conversations sound like? How many different types of proposals do you like? What does that mean? Oh boy, I can't even count the number of different uh, names and machinations that might have been uh, involved in this over time and, and through the years. Some players, frankly, that don't play for us anymore, and um, but, but were part of conversations back in 2021. And you know, in this particular instance, I, what does that mean? I would say probably no less than a hundred phone calls over the course of time, and and, and just sticking with it. Um, you know, I, I've, I've had many conversations with some of the leaders from the Twins, and, and fortunately, Justin has a wonderful relationship with, with some people in the Twins front office. And, and I think on this one, relationships won out. They just kind of stuck with it until the ice broke. How would you characterize the, mov- the movements of the entire league this offseason? Uh, you know, it's been, it's been a weird uh, – it's been a weirdly active offseason, despite the fact that there's still – quite a few free agents, you know, still out there looking for, for work. And, and I suspect it's going to be a very active two, three weeks leading into spring training because of that. Let's get back to Polanco here for, for a moment. What is it that has attracted you guys to him for so long? You know, he, he does all of the things that we value very highly. He is He manages the strike zone well. He's always been – uh, an on-base threat. He has power. It's been a 30 home run hitter in a in a really a difficult ballpark to hit. Um, you know, it's Minnesota is not naturally a, among the the best places in the league to hit. He's virtually split neutral from the left and right side. He has power from both sides. Hit the ball hard. Has some hit ability and feel to move it around the field. Uh, he's uh, it's. He has on rates been about as good as, as a second baseman in our league has been over the last three or four or five years, you know, based on on base slug, OPS, you know, WRC plus, you know, put him in put him in the, the, the conversation with some of the better performers at his position in the league. And, and he's done it in a town where you don't get a ton of attention. So, you know, as a result, maybe he's not a household name for many people, but we think he's a really good player. I know Justin had mentioned the injury history, and you guys have done, done your homework on that in, in you know big, big ways. How would you kind of look at maybe his previous few years and some of the injuries and the, and the bug that has bit him there and what that could project to here moving ahead? Uh, you know, I mean, I guess it, past injury certainly it projects to concern for future injury. But if you play the game for long enough, you're going to have an injury history. That's just the way it goes. And and Jorge's 30 years old. He is in tremendous physical condition. We don't think the the injuries that he's dealt with, particularly hamstrings, are particularly ominous as we move out into the future. And and the bigger issues that he's dealt with, they've, they've been effectively taken care of uh, in, in the past. And we have no reason to believe that, that he won't show up and post because, you know, while last year was a fractured season for him and playing time, 
he finished strong, and that was more the anomaly. You know, it, typically he's a guy that posts and gets out there and, and does his work. And do I understand he's got a pretty good workout partner in Tampa that he trains with? Is that true? Well, he's got a good team of workout partners. He hits with Julio um, and among others. And it's a, it's a star-studded cast that hit together in Tampa during the, the winters. And, and Jorge's among them. And, you know, I, I imagine that, that the relationship that he's developed with Julio over time is going to be a benefit as he, as he joins our clubhouse. And, and we've always received tremendous feedback on, on the type of person he is, his leadership qualities, just general work ethic and positivity. So, you know, really excited to put him with our group. Have you talked to Julio much this offseason? And, and I had told uh, Justin Amora to not let me get through this interview without making me or reminding me to ask you about him because I think he, he, for whatever reason, as we focused on what the team is doing in general, we've almost forgotten to talk about the next steps for Julio and how he can continue to put this team on his back over the next few years. Where do you think Julio's at coming into this season? Uh, you know, I have, I've, I've, I've spoken with him. I spent some time with him and, uh, I, I'm thrilled with where he is. And I know more recently, you know, Scott had an opportunity to visit with him down in Tampa just a, a couple of weeks ago. And he is in a tremendous place. I, I think right now Julio is focused on, on the right things. He's, he's focused on, on taking that next step as a player. Maybe most importantly, he's focused on taking that next step as a team leader, which is an exciting thing is, uh, you know, watching him mature as a, as a person and as a player uh, over these last couple of years has, has really been fun. And, and my sense in spending some time with him this off season is that he is really you know, chomping at the bit to take the next step and and be you know a, a a center point in a clubhouse and and I think that's a you know that's a big thing for for such a young player. But he's he has accomplished so much in his time in the league and and I think his teammates respect both what he does on the field and how he prepares and and I'm excited to see what that next step looks like for him. Hey, if we were to back up a couple of months to the beginning of your off season and start you know if we were in your meetings as you guys were preparing your goals here's what we want to accomplish over the course of the next few months before we get to spring training what were your goals and and how did you set about accomplishing them uh you know i we're our mantra this off season was just find a way find a way to get better and you know however that that exists uh we we did not want to move off of our starting pitching uh we really believe in that group and you know we managed to get to this point and and we've not touched it and i think that's that's exactly where we hope we'd land and i think we got better we found a way um you know we wanted to string out a longer lineup we wanted to create depth and options and alternatives and i and i think we've managed to do that um you know i I feel very confident in saying that that the lineup depth, one through nine, any given day, the impact from both the left and right side, the, the, the track records. We just have – there's more predictability to our offense than there has been in, in quite some time. And, you know, we did slightly, if ever, uh, improve our contact rates. And I think that's naturally going to get better as some of our younger players, you know, continue to grow. And, you know, while we did open up a hole in our bullpen with this last trade, I feel like by and large from the starting five to the back end of our bullpen with Brash and Mooney and Spire, I feel like we're in really good shape uh, across our 13-man pitching staff. And and I've never been more confident in the depth and, and complete look of an offense as this one. Does it feel like, Jerry, from, from our purview here, it feels like, 29 other teams in baseball doing similar to you guys where they're holding on to their strengths, holding on to their young difference makers, holding on to, Hey, this is who we are. And, and, you know, maybe 10 years ago, we were more willing to move some of these pieces. Does it, at least from my seat, does it feel like 29 other teams have taken some of that same strategy as you guys have? Uh, I, you know, I don't know if it's really changed through the years. It's uh, teams have, have generally always shown a preference to to, to build around a core, and, and that core is almost always going to be comprised of young players or players that came through your system, and and then you build around it. And you know, some teams get more aggressive in in one area of player acquisition than another. You know, we we have our niche, and we we lean into it, and that's what we do. 
You know, I, I think about uh, you just say opening up a hole in the bullpen with the Topa trade, and I'm sure it was difficult for you guys to give up on on Justin after what he did last year and coming off of giving up on Paul. Not that you wanted to give up either guy, but had to in order to make the deals you made. What does that look like to try to replace some of that productivity, especially in the leverage you know portion of your bullpen? Well, we we're very confident, like I said, and and those three guys that man the back end, and you know Mooney and Brash and and Gabe Spire, who very quietly had an awesome year for us last year. You know, we've got our bullet, our our pivot man, and, and Sauce, and I think that group is is you know we're, they are both experienced in the back end, and they are coming off good years, all four of them. And, and, you know, the challenge now exists to find a way of taking that group and matching it up with the guys that give us a little more length, you know, the Trent Thorntons and the Austin Bops. That's a, in the, in between there, we have a variety of big power arms that we've picked up this off season. Guys like Carlos Vargas. Uh, we, we have Prolander Barroa and house Jackson Coar. We've picked up a, a couple of guys on small deals through the course of the winter that we're excited about. And we've generally done very well in this area. And, you know, somewhere among Vargas and Coar and Baroa and Butri and Kreibel, and th- we are we are going to turn up something of a gem. Uh, we've always been able to do that, and I'm very confident in our pitching people and in the arm talent that each of those guys brings to the table. Just on that same subject, what about sort of the starting depth? Where, where are you guys at with start? Because I know when... Di Sclafani was brought in. That was part of the thinking there. What what does that now look like? Yeah, you know, I think while it takes a ding moving Tony out the door, he's he was by far the most experienced of of the the next group of starters we had after our front five. You know, we still have Austin Pop who has done a really nice job of bouncing between the the rotation and the bullpen. And and when given an opportunity to start, he's actually been, you know, quite effective as a major league pitcher. And uh, he's, he's in that mix, uh, probably going to line up as our swing man to start the season. If, if everybody's healthy, uh, similarly, we stretched out Trent Thornton, who has a history as a starter, and you know we're going to give him the opportunity to come in and and showcase his ability to provide length. Uh, we've got a healthy Emerson Hancock coming back for the start of spring training, which is a real positive. You know, we've got the reliable strike throwers like a Tyson Miller and a Darren McCacken, who are lined up uh, to start in Triple A, and and I feel like we're in pretty good shape there. You know, it's, uh, to start the season feeling like your depth chart in the starting rotation is is at least ten deep, you're going to use you know nine to twelve guys in a blink. So having having those guys at the ready. And we feel like there's a next week, you know, there's a couple of, of younger pitchers who are going to start the season in double A who are very high on guys like Reed Van Scoder and Jimmy Joy. So we feel like can really help out. I love that mantra. Find a way. As you said that I wrote down the name, Mitch Hanniger. How big a deal was getting Mitch back in the fold for both the clubhouse, the organization, and just his leadership. Yeah, it was fun. And uh, I was maybe the the most pleased I've been all off season was, was hearing how pleased he was uh, with the idea of coming back. So uh, it's, uh, I think it is good for our young players. It's good for the guys who've been in the clubhouse with Mitch because they know what his preparation and, and diligence the uh, Mitch takes it seriously. Uh, and I think that's something that, that really uh, helps our clubhouse. And it was a void that we were missing last year. So, um, you know, it's, I think in that way, it's a real positive. I'm also pretty confident that a healthy Mitch Hanniger makes us a lot better offensively. And, you know, right now he's in a good place. I can't wait to see where he's at. He's already down in Peoria working out and, and ready for the start of spring training. So excited to see what he looks like on the field as well. I think of everything you've said in the last 15 minutes, that's probably the least surprising thing, that he's already there getting ready, <laughs> training, <laughs> making sure he's on top of it. That's like the most Mitch Hanniger thing I could imagine. Jerry, uh, we uh, appreciate you taking the time today. It's kind of a, it's kind of an interesting offseason. It doesn't look like some of the others we've seen here but excited to see what it looks like when we get down to peoria and see what it uh, how it plays out on the field so thanks for joining us we appreciate it you got it guys i'll right. see you there you go there's jerry depoto uh, mariners president of baseball operations after making the deal yesterday <laughs> to acquire jorge polanco from the twins a deal that they've been looking to make for a few years now